Hi, my name is Christopher, and today I'm going to talk about how Shazam uses hashing tables and hashing functions in their audio search algorithm. For those of you who aren't familiar with Shazam, let me tell you how this music recognition app works. Uh, Shazam can listen to music with you and identify it by artist, track, and usually album name. And the way it does this is by taking a short uh, 10 second clip with the microphone on your cell phone. So it also captures whatever ambient noise is around you, any reverberation, distortion, and kind of filters through it. Um, it then processes and transmits that information over your mobile network to its back end where it's compared against an enormous database of 8 million songs. Um, and then it returns this, this information and it does this fairly quickly, maybe 30 seconds tops from beginning to end and uh, with a very low rate of false positives. So um, if we take this database of 8 million songs, assuming an average song length of about three minutes, which, which is probably a conservative guess, we're talking about uh, 45 straight years of sound. Um, finding 10 seconds out of 45 years is, in the developer's own words, a hard problem. <laughs> so the question I aim to answer for you today is, how do they do it? So uh, this presentation will consist of four components. First, I will discuss four guiding principles that the team at Shazam set for themselves when they set out to design this algorithm. Second, I'll describe how Shazam processes an audio file and produces a fingerprint of it. Uh, third, I will e explain how Shazam searches for that fingerprint within their database. And finally, share some closing thoughts and key takeaways. Shazam's uh, audio search algorithm relies on fingerprinting a process that takes an audio data file as an input and returns a numerical fingerprint or signature of it. It's, it's a lot like a hash function in the sense that it is a pure process that should return identical hashes for identical audio files. And of course, uh, identical hashes would imply the existence of identical audio files. So um, in devising this algorithm, Shazam committed to meeting four guiding principles. And these principles reveal some of the constraints and objectives that the team at Shazam must have anticipated as they got into this project. And, and personally, contemplating them um, before knowing how they did it is a humbling exercise. Uh, the first, temporal locality, basically requires that uh, the fingerprints should not be affected by where in the track um, it, has, it has been extracted from. And this makes sense because anyone who's listened to music knows that you don't get a uniform sonic soundscape when you listen to music. There are contrasts, there are ups and downs. Um, so it also means that individual audio files will have multiple fingerprints. If, and if there is a trademark of Shazam's method, it's this. It's that it is a fingerprint of sub-fingerprints. The second principle, translation invariance, requires that fingerprints be reproducible regardless of their position in the audio file. And this also makes sense because um, the algorithm does not assume that the client provided sample comes from the beginning of the track. It can come from anywhere in the track. Third, um, hashes must be robust and able to withstand heavy distortion, ambient noise, and otherwise degraded audio sources. It can ev should even be able to withstand the presence of other musical files, which is really something if you think about it. Um, and the fourth principle, entropy. Actually, this comes from the, the patent paperwork for the algorithm. And they're a little uh, shifty about what entropy really stands for. My read of it is that entropy is a measure of hash independence. And they do offer that insufficient entropy would lead to spurious matches and false positive, whereas excessive entropy would lead to non-reproducible hashes. OK, so the first step in implementing the algorithm is to index the database. And this is a fairly involved process. First, they produce uh, spectrographic analyses of each audio file in the database. A spectrogram is a three-dimensional visual representation of sound that plots time and frequency and what's usually referred to as intensity, which seems to more or less map onto amplitude. I say more or less because it'll also catch things like overtone collisions. Um, then they extract the moments of highest intensity from the spectrogram and plot these points 
on a two-dimensional graph of time and frequency. And I've provided an example of this on the following slide. On the left, you can see a, a black and white spectrogram. Uh, the x-axis plots time, the y-axis plots frequency, and then those shades of white and black and gray represent intensity. On the right, you can see the corresponding graph. The z, or intensity axis, has been stripped away, leaving only points on a graph of time and frequency. Um, and this also comes from the patent paperwork, and if we can take it at face value, uh, it would suggest that we're looking at three peaks per second of sound. But I have also read from an unconfirmed source that uh, it doesn't really work until you have at least 30 points per second of sound. So take that with a grain of salt. And you can see that this graph somewhat resembles a star field, so they're often referred to as constellation maps. Okay, so that's the first step in indexing the database, but we're not done yet. Um, after producing a map of peaks, they create a combinatorial hash for each peak. Um, okay, this involves selecting a peak, um, depicted in the example on the left as an anchor point, and a corresponding target zone of neighboring pe peaks. The anchor point is paired with each peak in the target zone uh, to produce a time frequency vector, which is a representation of the relationship between those two points in terms of change in frequency over change in time. I wonder if I should slow down. Um, <laughs> uh, and you can see that uh, uh, the target zone can include multiple target peaks, right? So then, all of those vectors are inputted into a hashing function, which produces a 32-bit integer. And finally, uh, at least finally for indexing the database, uh, that integer is prepended to another integer, which includes basically just identifying information, the artist, track, and album, and also, this will come back, um, a time offset value, which just represents the amount of time between the beginning of the track and where that point is in the spectrogram. Uh, this process, process is extended through every second of the database, creating an expansive index of tables of combinatorial hashes. And I should pause to mention now that uh, by this point in the process, three out of four of those guiding principles have already been met. Fingerprints are temporally localized, spanning only a couple seconds of a track at a time. Uh, the process is clearly reproducible, and because the algorithm ultimately relies on combinations of combinations of the highest intensity moments, which are themselves fairly resistant to distortion and uh, reverberation, these hashes are extremely robust. According to the patent, um, an audio recording, like a sample audio recording, need only retain one to two percent of its original peaks in order to produce an accurate match under ideal conditions. One to two percent. I'm not sure you could even recognize that music with only one or two percent of the data. Uh, so, um, by this point in the process, the algorithm has effectively exchanged the problem of matching a 10 second clip to a three minute song within a 45 year universe of sound with the problem of matching multiple consecutive hashes. And here the magic of hash tables comes into play. Shazam's search algorithm um, has an n log n search time under the worst conditions and so they say, constant search time under ideal conditions. So how do they, how do they search? Okay, first, they perform the same fingerprinting process on the sample. Uh, and second, they search for it within, in, within the database making two passes. The first pass looks for matches uh, beyond a certain threshold, which is a criterion that they can adjust for differing use cases. Um, once a match is found, or once match, multiple matches are found, the time offsets from the sample are adjusted uh, to match the offsets from the indexed original. Then, a second pass looks for hard matches, uh, which, would, which would be multiple matching hashes per second for the entirety of the clip. And then you would find out what you're listening to. It's Kanye. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not. I can think of multiple limitations to this approach. So uh, first, because hash matches rely on corresponding time offsets, slightly speeding up or slowing down the sample would probably uh, cause the algorithm to return a false positive or nothing at all. Um, and that's because those time offsets are, are necessary to produce multiple matching hashes in a row. Uh, this, and and that's a, that's, I mean, this isn't a null, this isn't like a trivial problem. Electronic dance music, hip hop, really any genre that relies on sampling is going to, is going to speed up and slow down their clips. So, that would be one limitation. And second, because the algorithm searches for exact matches, um, it's, 
it's not looking for fuzzy matches. And so it probably wor wouldn't work very well with live performances or cover versions. Um, finally, I would identify a few key takeaways from this talk. The first and, and most obvious to my mind is that one way to solve a very hard problem is to exchange it for only a pretty hard problem. Um, Shazam's audio search algorithm is really creative and interesting, but really it's the, the um, 10 second clip out of a 45 year universe of sound that's most impressive about it. Um, second, when we think of hashing functions, or at least I, when I think of hashing functions, I often think of their utility in encryption uh, because of the way hashing functions can take a recognizable string or key and turn it into an incomprehensible sequence of numbers. Um, yet, here we have hashing turning an unwieldy audio object actually into a simplified representation. So the second lesson would be that hashing functions are also great for reducing and managing complexity. Thank you.